the passage that we're doing. This is 2 Kings 2, 1 through 5, 15. And this is Elijah's last day on earth. Okay? So hit it. First Kings, 2 Kings 2, 2 1 Kings 2. Uh -huh. Okay. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilead. And Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elijah and said to him, Do not know that today, do you not know that today the Lord will take you away from your master from over you? And he said, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Elijah said to him, Elijah, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were in Jericho drew near to Elijah and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take you away from your master from over you? And he said, and he answered, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and stuck it and struck the water, and the water was parted to the one side and the other, till the two of them could go over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elijah, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elijah said, Please let there be no double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they, were, as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up in a whirlwind into heaven. And Elijah saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces, and he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And then he had struck the water, and the water was parted to one side and to the other, and Elijah went above, went over. And verse 15. Okay. You want me to finish? 15? Yes. Okay. Now, when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him uh, uh, opposite them, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elijah. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. All right. Now, what would you think the title of this lesson is by this author that did our D6 lesson for today? Gone in a whirlwind. <laughs> Chariots no. of fire. No. <laughs> you know what it is, so you can't answer anyway. <laughs> well, it's called Found Faithful. Now, I would have read this many times, and I don't know if I'd have got that description uh, as what it was. But the more I read, and I thought, that's not who, uh, what verses or, or Bible characters I would have chosen to, to illustrate this point. But the more I read, it really does illustrate the point uh, very well, and I feel a little bit better about it after I was rather critical about the verses, okay? Um, but um, we're Second Kings 2, 1 through 15. You might want to look there because I'm going to ask some questions. Okay, well, let me ask you to start with who are our, who are our cast of characters in this passage? And Elijah and Elijah. And one more group. Now we got prophets. Yeah, the sons of the prophets are a company of prophets. You know, Elijah is as much revered in the Old Testament as Moses is. And, you know, those two were the only two that so were carried over to Jesus' life on the Mount of Transfiguration. Transfiguration okay. So Elijah was a pretty important character because after he lived, the, the Jewish people, the Israelites, really revered him. And he's referred to on other occasions. In fact, someone else in the New Testament is compared to Elijah. Jesus? John, John the Baptist. John the Baptist, okay. Yeah, and the idea was, come on in. The idea was that, you know, Elijah was calling the people to repent from their idolatry in the Old Testament, and, and, and John the Baptist was calling them to repent and be prepared to, to 
meet Jesus. Okay, so, and and the other two other thing is they both wore animal clothes. Okay, I didn't realize that. Ray uh, Ahab mentions that man that's wearing animal clothes when when Elijah shows up, probably the first time in in Kings. Okay, he was the uh, well Ahab was was. Um, Elijah's nemesis, although Elijah, although Ahab thought Elijah was his nemesis, okay, so they didn't have any lost love. Uh, I guess Elijah did love uh, Ahab, but he didn't appreciate his evil ways. And so, you know, and his big, his big fame in the Old Testament when we think about Elijah is what? Talking down the fire on the prophets of Baal. Oh, yeah. You know, when they were supposed to uh, worship Baal, and, and he, he uh, put the... Uh, Test to the prophets of Baal. You know, in the end, uh, God called out fire after they soaked the, the offering three times or so with water and it ran down into the trenches around the altar. And in one fiery bolt, it was all soaked up and destroyed. Come on in. So, uh, Elijah has a lot of meaning. Then Elisha uh, is also our next character, and he was the protege of Elijah. Elijah. I guess taught him everything he knew, okay? But we also see at the end of this that what happened to Elisha, he got a double portion. Double portion. And so in the Old Testament, you know, with that sort of refers back to the Jewish culture and the custom and uh, of that the oldest son got a double portion uh, of the inheritance, okay? So uh, Elijah, uh, Elisha asked for that, okay? So let's just go back right quick and go through this just real quick because that is not what I need to be at, okay? <laughs> okay. Elijah and Elisha started on their journey from where? Verse 1, he last asked, word. Okay. Or Gilgal. And they were headed to Bethel. And we got to Bethel. Uh, uh, well, all along the way, Every time they go somewhere, Elijah says to Elisha, "What?" Seize the dead. Or soon. Have it soon, right? Well, uh, no. Elijah Lord tells Elisha to do what? Stay. Stay. Don't come with me. Stay. But Eli uh, Elisha says, "What?" I'm going. Yeah. Uh -huh. As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. And this is sort of an oath. They said that it really meant something. It was a promise. And then, he says it three times everywhere they go, okay? So they leave Bethel and they go to Jericho. Jericho. And the same thing happens, okay? And everywhere they go, what is said to Elisha? When they get to each of these places, the prophets tell him what? <coughs> Don't you know that Elijah's leaving today? And Elisha always says, yeah, I know. So at least in the beginning, Elisha and the prophets knew that. And probably Elijah did too, but not until we get down to, I think, verse 8. Uh, maybe, maybe not. It's somewhere down <coughs> there. Elijah said, you know, I'm going to go up in a whirlwind today. So, um, obviously, God had made known to them. So, they get down to crossing the river Jordan. It is said that by scholars that probably these places were Bethel, Jericho, and Gilgal, and the the hill country of Ephraim, which I guess that's what this is supposed to be where they're watching what happens when they cross the Jordan, although I don't know, you can tell me that later if that's right. Uh, Trey, I didn't go look that up. I didn't get a map out to see where Ephraim was in the Jordan. And, you know. But anyway, those are four groups that, um, that Elijah had uh, prophets that he mentored, okay? And all of them uh, have, have studied under uh, Elisha. Well, the last group goes along and they stand afar, but they watch what happens. And what happens when they cross the, get to the Jordan? Well, but what happens at first? How do they get across Jordan? They struck the water with the float. And it parted. You know, I, I love that part in the waters. Okay, when I get to heaven, 
I want to go to the video library, <laughs> the blockbuster library. I still have school. Uh, Frank's heard me say this. He knows it. I want to look at the party in the Red Sea because I've seen the movie and I just want to see all oh, the watches go up. I just think that is unbelievable. It looks like I want to see the creation first. I want to go to waters and then go back to creation. <laughs> anyway, so part of the Red Sea, they went over, and then and then Elisha asked uh, Elijah says. What can I do for you? And Elisha says, "Give me a double portion of your spirit." And what does Elisha? What does Elijah? <laughs> start? said the wrong one first. What does Elijah tell Elisha when he asks that? That's a biblical thing. It's not mine to give. Okay, that's God. Okay, and it was all those prophets. You know, God pulled them out. Elijah didn't go around and anoint them or appoint them. They were appointed by God to do their thing. So, and. Uh, so, but he said, you can only get this if one thing happens. And what did it have to happen for Elisha to get Elijah's cloak? If he sees him, then he's taken. taken. Okay. So he sees him, and then the cloak falls the ground. He picks it up and puts it on, and that's a sign that, you know, God is passing on his, his blessings and his uh, instructions to Elisha to do the uh, work which Elijah was doing, okay? And also, I mean, it is also important that across the river, the, the group of those prophets of God saw this because then they recognized what? Who was in charge? Elijah. Elijah was then gonna be there to mentor, instruct them and all that, so. So, faithful, our, um, Arthur says two key truths. Okay, I have a few more things I did, but faithful believers serve God as long as they live, and certainly Elijah did that. And we know as we keep reading about Elisha, he did that also. And then the last part, he, the last part where Eli, Elisha asked of double portion, he says, faithful believer seeks God's power to accomplish God's work. And that is true. I want to go there and apply this to our faithfulness and how we found faithful. If God called us home today, what would he, what would people say about us how, if we, how we were faithful? What legacy are you leaving? Because I want to use this as a jumping off for of where I'm going now. Okay, and then y'all are going to have all the answers and y'all are going to teach the rest of the class because I think it is very important. And I'm going to, I'm going to uh, then tell some of the things that I, I hope we did growing up. Now, let's see. As you know, I have no nothing in I only wrote that up there. Oh, yeah, he has some notes, okay. Uh, I'm going to try to play this if it comes on top of it, okay? With Kroger Delivery, you can enjoy holiday specials delivered to Now you have the words. And if you want to sing along with you know it, David. I do not. I away had the words cheering on the faithful, encouraging the weary, their lives a stirring testament to God's sustaining grace. This is it, you can say it. I so kind a cloud of weaknesses. Let us run the race, not only for the prize, but as those who've gone before us, turn it over, leave <laughs> to find us the heritage of faithfulness passed on through godly life. Don't come behind us, front page. <laughs> 
teacher because I'm from the old school I'd have him to get up here and sing the song for you yeah. he was not paying attention very well he was too busy I was doing my the the office I love that song I heard it and I want that song in my funeral because we'll I want because I want my family there to think about that, okay? And so I guess the jumping off point for the application of found faithful is what are you doing now and what do you plan to do in the future for your children and your children's children to be found faithful based on your life? Now, we have 20 minutes to talk about this, okay? Because I ranked them and left out half that stuff because Steve put me on the time clock because our class is cut by 10 minutes today. So, and this is important. Do you, do you think about this? I don't think I think as much as future generations as I, I think about myself, obviously. I think about my children. Why? Well, I think really, I think, I think, I think the big thing is your children, okay? <laughs> But you know, if your children aren't faithful when you're dead, then what are their chances of their being faithful? And I, that will give me a jumping off point for there. Uh, Jennifer's father, there were six in his family, and he was the oldest son. He was the second child oldest. And he was very faithful. In fact, my father-in-law served as an elder for 50 years and about 10 years as a deacon, okay? He was very faithful. And while his mother and father were Christians, and that's how Tommy became a Christian, the rest of the family was not so, but Tommy led and pulled and conjoled and did whatever, and they all ended up but one being faithful. But however, his brother and um, sister-in-law were faithful, but then he got transferred from Scottsburg to North Carolina and in North Carolina, something happened at church or something happened then, and they quit going. And for the rest of the time they were over there, they didn't go to church. And he went over there to work. So after he retired, he moved back to Scottsville. By this time, he's had children. The children are married, and some of them are their second husbands or 
or spouses, and some were even as time went on on their third, and they never went to church. Okay, but then Tommy's uh, second wife, Jennifer's mother, died when she was nineteen and when she was ten. When Jennifer was nineteen and she was ten, and, and Tommy, her father, remarried three years later, and uh, that wife died after twenty six years of a brain tumor, and when she died, the brother and the sister-in-law who didn't come to church, who, who Tommy had tried to encourage after they came back to him didn't, uh, came to the funeral and they asked him, what can we do for you? He said, I wish you'd come to church tomorrow. And they came and they never quit coming. They rededicated their lives and they died faithful Christians. They should have not go to church. So it's not only what you do now, it's what you do all along okay? I mean it is wonderful that people find the Lord but and it's but you know you are sowing seeds for your children to find their way you're leaving footprints okay so it's just very important so you know I guess what I'm saying is really right now Alicia what are you what are, right now are you doing for the for in serving the Lord so your children will want to serve the Lord or do and I can tell you what you do, so I, if you don't have an answer, I know already. And I haven't even been up here to church to see you do it. <laughs> I'm trying really hard to call it my mom because, like, she did with us, carrying us everywhere as she served. Okay, and what little I did happen to go with Trey the, about the first time y'all were here, and that was before Jennifer got so sick and, and everything again and visited them. And I was quite impressed with them, and they have all these kids. Okay, I don't know, <laughs> there were so many, I feel not sure how many there were. <laughs> uh, I feel that way. That I only needed two kids, and they need to be eight years apart because even my grandson, I call him Liam. I mean, I mean even my grandson Liam, I call him Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> One day, Liam looked at me and said, "I'm not Stephen, I'm Liam." Okay, so I could never have any children. I never got the names right, but yes, that's true. Okay, lead in front of your children to make them and start young. Okay, if you wait till they're teenagers, you're done. Okay, oh, yeah. they're 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 emotions, their decisions, what they desire are already long since and if you haven't put that desire in them, then you're gonna you're gonna be fine and not feel bad. So sidebar on I've read uh, some kind of stat or something crazy study that basically you got until the age of twelve or thirteen to really impress upon a kid. That really sets them up, you know, their thought process for the entire future on faith. Um that's kinda of scary. Especially yeah. my kids and all of my kids are well what uh, David, what are you, Anna? What are y'all doing with your kids to lay footprints for them to follow the Lord? Be around. David, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to keep him at his knee and <laughs> Well, I mean, I think everybody will probably answer the same way. It's just like you, there's probably a hundred. It's like home improvement projects. It's it's like a hundred partially finished tasks. <laughs> You know, and and you, you know, like well, I need I need to give them a good prayer life, and, and okay, that's that's okay. Prayer, that's work, right. I want to go. Oh, okay. fantastic! So that was what I was talking about. <laughs> How do you do that? Well, I, you know, I don't. Again, I don't always do great at it. You know, I, I I've gone in and out of different habits in the morning, um, trying to pray with. And I don't know why I haven't done it with Banks. It's it's more of a dumpster fire, I guess, with him. But um, <laughs> Lindley trying to you know pray with her before she gets out for school and you know and it, honestly it's like in my mind the, the, the quantity the, the subject matter of the prayer is almost irrelevant as much as her seeing us stop in the car um, and, and for whatever reason the habit I've gotten into is when Anna takes her I pray with her in the car I don't have as good a, you know I'm trying to navigate the drop off line I don't do as good a job and that's kind of the thing it's like all it takes is one little you know. But you know, I think they kids are real smart and they really deduct a lot. They're seeing you try to do that, okay? 
And do they ever stop and say, oh, we didn't say a prayer for the food, or, or you didn't pray with me. I, I, I love that, okay? Uh, you know, as y'all well know, Deborah was very sick, and six weeks ago, I wasn't sure that she was gonna be here. And uh, thankfully for your righteousness, you prayed her out of it. The Lord heard your prayers, and she's alive because of prayers, believe me. If you don't believe that, ask Charles and Sherry Elliott who came up there and stayed two days with us. <laughs> They were about to plan a funeral for me. So, but um, um, so we were praying a lot. Okay, for and, and this I always love it when you get a little feedback, thinking, "Yeah, we're doing something right," or "My kids are doing something right." Liam goes to Mother's Day out of whatever twice a week, and and they were having a prayer, and he asked, "Could he lead the prayer that day?" And specifically, he prayed for Jin Jin. That's what he called their mother. You know, that just melts your heart. Okay. So he's learning now that you need to pray for your loved ones and for sick and beseech the Lord. So you're doing that. Yes, it's not always easy. And sometimes you mess up. Uh, but, you know, I always feel like when I mess up, because I didn't quite a lot, because sometimes, well, I'll say this for you. I don't think you've heard me say this, okay? I, I never worried about what I was teaching when I was teaching my children. What I worried about when I was teaching my children when I wasn't teaching my children. You know how I responded to a situation. <laughs> I'm more than one occasion I had to go back and say, Daddy was wrong and he shouldn't have got upset about this and you know, and whatever, or apologize. And I think that's important because Christianity is striving for perfection. <laughs> it means we're imperfect people saved by God's grace. But we have to realize that and you know, and you have to teach that to your children. All right, tell me some other things. Hey, Dr. Chandler, there's a there's an example that came out in here, and I don't know if it was when Zach was, I think it was when you were teaching last, but it's it stuck with me, and the I think the example I gave during class was an absolute train wreck, but in my brain it made perfect sense. He was talking about imitation, like imitating Christ. Oh, imitation crap? Yes. yes. Yeah, I remember that. And so <laughs> we were, he was talking about, you know, and so like we, we can't be Christ. We, we will never be Christ. And so uh, imitation crab is closer to being crab than it is being vanilla. So imitation, and, and, and this is going as well as it did about buckle up. But, but the, the, the idea of it is if we try to imitate Christ, we are going to be as close to Christ as we can be, and it's it, and the reason I'm even saying this is it's almost like the effort, I, and I say this a lot when we're, I'm talking to fellow parents and stuff, it's almost feel like if we're thinking about it and we're worried about it and we're stressing over it when it comes to the way we teach our kids and the example we are to our kids, that that's half the battle. And it's like if we're trying to imitate Christ, well, we're never gonna be Christ, and the imitation of crap's pretty awful, but we're closer to crab than we are to Vanilla still didn't get it, but, but I feel like it's a, I, I it's a good I got it. Yes, you did. I, I don't. I got, I got it. it. Okay, I don't know if imitation crap is such an illustration. Y'all know yeah. about. It. I've never put. I've never. I've never. Had it. <laughs> I, I, I will say this: Y'all will learn. You will learn. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be sixty-nine in December. Jim turns sixty-nine in October. I read y'all's little banters going back and forth. And at least 90% of the time, I have no clue. What <laughs> and I relate that to my mother. When I was y'all's age, my mother would hear something or she'd watch TV, she'd say, I don't understand that, okay? I don't understand that. <laughs> Your day will come, I promise you. You don't believe that, but every time you rolled your eyes at your parents or me, you will come back and say, boy, they really didn't know what they're talking about, okay? Because everything, I thought my parents were out in left field with I had come back to eat those words. <laughs> Just be prepared, okay? You get, get a lot of salt and pepper to kind of be able to swallow. But anyway, I love y'all's banter, but I, I'm like most of the time clueless. <laughs> That's why I never respond, hardly ever, okay? I just pray for you guys. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, I, um, what did some other people do?
biblical application if you're listening. And that's why I've tried, oh, well, maybe I need to turn the music off when I'm in the mom taxi with the kids or and actually listen and then turn, turn around what's happening in their life right now and say, well, you know, or like before school in the morning when they're getting out of the car, y'all be a good friend to somebody today, you know. Look for the kid who needs a friend. I love and, it. Rachel, just the, the time of good. life they're in. And I know I could do better, but I'm like trying to teach them. It's not all about them. That's one of the hardest things as a parent. You want to build your child up, but let them know, hey, you're not it. You know, and that's one of the hardest things to do, I think. Yes, Frank. I just think it's so important that we be here. And our kids, are, we bring our kids and be here. Today, it just seems like uh, yes. it's no problem to go absent for a week. But our kids are watching that, and they see us. So I can go on, but I'll stop. <laughs> well, you are. That was one. Thank you. That you're jumping. You, the Lord's working through you here, and me too. <laughs> commitment to be at church and church activities. Okay. What are your commitments for Bell Life? Are you committed to every Sunday to be at church unless someone's sick? It doesn't matter if it's raining or I, I was up all night partying. I'm still going to go to church and, and uh, worship God. And I don't yes. tell your children you're up all night partying. Yeah. And when I say partying, I'm not talking about drinking. Not talking about drinking back there on the video. <laughs> But, you know, that was a commitment we had. Our children always knew that we go to church. It's not like we get up and decide if we're going to go to church today. I forget who recently was telling me they grew up in a family where their mother did take, I don't know who it was now, but did take, did take the church, but it was, they decided they're going today. I'm like, well, that's not much of a commitment. Y'all need to decide what your commitments are. Tell them to your children and stick to them, okay? We had a commitment that when we went on vacation, we didn't vacate from the Lord. We went to church where we were, if at all possible. Yep. Uh, and let me tell you what, it is a blessing. Go in there and say, and go there to bless, bless the people there. Because a lot of times on vacation, you won't find a, a Beltline church that has 700 members. I'm sorry I'm letting you off for it. <laughs> what did I say? Uh, and bless them. They mostly small churches love to have visitors. We we go to um, the Greatest Monkey Mountain Church of Christ in Pigeon Forge, and they love visitors. Okay, and I love to go when it's not visitor season because it's really obvious we're a visitor. When it's summertime, they'll be uh, the church will be almost packed, and they'll have the members stand up and they're just voted here and there, and they're not many. Okay, so. You know, that's an opportunity, and you, you want to show each other, we're going to bless them. They're going to be excited to see us and just take part and be a part. And, and that's just a great time, and that also makes them have fun at it, okay? Be sure that when you're teaching them, so the Lord, that they see it as fun, not a dread. Oh, we got to do this. i got to put on this, or i got to smile, you know, all that. So, uh, we try to help every, you know, it, it's hard for his identity. He's a church boy, and you know, we were teaching him to become a church boy. And he'll say, I'm a church boy. <laughs> you know? Dr. Jenna, yes. One of the things that I think how our situation is evolving, how everybody's will, depending on how old your kids are, I think we, as young kids, you know, we're here, we're active, we're investing in our church, we're investing in our friends together. You know, those, those things become habits. You know, praying when you can take your kids to school. Then, part of the routine, praying for a meal, sitting down as a family together, being with family as much as possible, like all those things become ingrained really early, and uh, devos at night, little things, and, and but as the kid gets older, you know, we're fighting a completely different battle today than what our parents oh, were. You are. Then. And so you are. My, my intention with Stella is becoming more, you know, we've, we've got, got a new book and that we're going to start sitting down with her to, to explain sexuality and sex in a biblical perspective. I think uh, somebody here gave it to us, and we're going to we're going to sit down with her soon and have that. Can I sit with me? I got a baby coming your way. You're going to be teaching the class. Yes. I, mean, I also think it's important too to point out sin. Um, it's hard for an 11 year old to understand. Uh, 
how God views sin, but when things are said, you know, somebody at school said something mean about somebody else, um, pointing that out. It was, we were in the car yesterday, and Stella said that you know, somebody referred to somebody. I don't know who that somebody is. She doesn't either, but the kids referred to that person as a Karen, and it's funny because her name is Karen. And so I had to point out that that is not right ever. We do, we do not let other people's words um, uh, form our opinions about somebody. We do not call people names like that. You know, but, but pointing out sin is a, is a must as a Christian. That, that, is, that is the whole purpose. It, we can't just sugarcoat everything all the time. And, and I think this meekness that Christians have take us out of the fight on a lot of these social issues. And we have to stand up and say, no, a man is a man, a woman is a woman. There's no gray area here. And that's a sin in the eyes of God. We're all created in his image. Y'all have a lot more on you than we do, okay, for sure. I had to Google Karen about a year ago to see what they I'm trying to stay relevant. Somebody called me Linda last week. I thought, who is Linda? Well, my parents didn't have to this conversation with me. They didn't have to. Well, no, no. But we have to now. Otherwise, they're going to be confused. Well, you know, everything was traditional when I grew up, okay? Now there's nothing that's traditional and everything's acceptable. Y'all y'all have a lot on your plate. That's why you can't lay down day or night teaching these things and pointing out because all day long the world and school and their friends are telling them, you're wrong, you know, you're not right. And you know, they just think, how can I be the only one that feels this way? So, all right, um, let me just say a few more things and I'm sorry I went through this so quickly. We, we try to involve our children like Alicia. We drug our kids everywhere we went when we were serving the Lord because we wanted to see if she struggled to grow up to the house with all this food. And her children jump out and they're helping, and I loved it. I loved it, okay? Uh, and that's what we used to do. We also developed a few things. We we learned to say the prayer at the table and hold hands. And at the end of the prayer, I squeezed their hand three times. Does anybody know what that means? I love, I love you. you. Mm -hmm. We do that. Okay, I've told this before. I thought you were going to say that. You've forgotten that. We only do it in I groups. love you. But let me tell you what. It is great. I'm losing my grip. It is great when you have a, when you have a teenage son, you're out somewhere and you're talking and you go, that's secret code. Nobody knew that. Of course, you're not going to go up and say, I love you to your 17 year old. They will melt no, and they'll be so embarrassed. And say, I'm never going to hurt you. And Stephen, we do that too with our little code. And we're like, we can just behind their back because they have no idea. So come on with some little things where you communicate yeah. and that they take hold of. I'll tell you one other thing I did, and I think I leave, is at 18, I gave my children the blessing. And what I did, we invited their close friends and the, their close adult friends that had been a big influence in their life for 18 years. And we had a big party and we celebrated. And then I prayed over him and I prayed for his future and his spouse <laughs> that he'd marry. And, that they'd have be faithful and they have faithful kids. Because I won't even remember that, okay? And also the teaching lessons were another friend, and you'd be surprised how many parents came to me and said, I love that. I read that in the book, so don't think that was uh, uh, unique, okay? I got plenty more, but not only do we have to quit, I've got to lead the prayer. So y'all gotta get out of here. <laughs> I'm sorry guys. I love y'all. Jennifer, I love y'all. We talk about you all the time. Y'all are amazing. And you're a blessing to us. Thank you. Maybe one of these days we'll be regulars. Since Jennifer